Hi YouTube, this is Raven again. In my last video I talked about how narcissists lie. And my narcissist lied by putting a gun in his mouth, trying to kill himself, using it as a manip manipulation tactic. Um, he was in the mental hospital for four days. The entire time he was telling me, everything's going to be alright honey, everything will be fine, our marriage is going to work out when in reality he was planning to divorce me and he was using that time to research the laws in our state and to find a lawyer. And he had, instead of telling me face to face that we're getting a divorce, he told my nine-year-old daughter who then told me. Well, after that, the next day, now bear in mind it's been seven days since he put a gun in his mouth and was trying, tried to kill himself supposedly, he showed up with a moving van and what I call flying monkeys. Uh, flying monkeys is a term that I first heard on Serena Nightshade's channel. Uh, she has a great channel. I suggest you check it out. There's a lot of videos on narcissistic personality disorder, on abusive relationships. She's great. Serena Nightshade. And flying monkeys refers back to the character in The Wizard of Oz, the, the multiple characters, that the Wicked Witch of the West had monkeys with wings on them. They're flying monkeys and they went and did her bidding. And the narcissist has flying monkeys as well. They're people that the narcissist has groomed, sometimes over years, telling them things about you. How you're abusive, you're manipulative. Everything pretty much that they do, they're probably going to project onto you and make themselves out to be the hero or the victim in their story. And they're so good at it that even sometimes your friends or members of your own family will believe them over over you because the narcissist is so good at lying that they can convince people of this and then they use these flying monkeys to abuse you by proxy and the way this happened is that um, the day after he had told our nine-year-old that we were getting a divorce and not me he descended upon our house with what I called also the plague of locusts it was his fan, pretty much his entire family and a friend. It was his parents, his brother, his sister, his sister-in-law, their kids, which was highly inappropriate to have them there, and his friend. And they had a moving van and boxes, and they were basically mo moving all of his stuff, which was really our stuff too. Uh, you know, moving our, you know, moving and taking our possessions. And I had not, I was not there at the time. My brother had taken me to the cell phone store because he was very worried that the narc was going to cancel my phone and then I wouldn't have any way to contact my family and it was a safety issue. So he took me to the cell phone store and got me a cell phone in his name. And we arrived to the scene of the moving van in front of the house with furniture and household items and the garage door open and all of this stuff strewn out on the yard and the driveway. And it kind of looked like a yard sale or a garage sale. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that the neighbors weren't driving by like, I'll give you five bucks for the garden gnome. You know, I can laugh about it now, but at the time it, it was not funny. And I need to backtrack a little bit. I did do something that was smart, and I suggest that you do it too if you're going through a divorce like this. I, after I'd gotten off the phone with him the night before, and you know, he had said that, yes, we are getting a divorce, I went and took the key to the safe. He had a safe with gold and silver coins in it and cash. And he had put this uh, gold and silver coins and cash in this safe when he was hiding money from the government when he was a tax protester because he believed that the income tax was illegal because the 16th Amendment was never properly ratified. Therefore, you don't owe income taxes. So he didn't pay income taxes for about five years. And because of that, the government put a lien on our house. They were going to take our house. So I took a stay-at-home job as a transcriptionist and paid back the $20,000 that we owed so we could keep our house. But he still had the money that he had been hiding from the government. And something in my mind told me that he might try to take that. So I took the key to the safe and I put it on myself. I also took my computer bag and I put my computer in it. So whenever I left the house, I always had my laptop with me because I didn't trust him. He had a key to the house. He could come and, you know, look at my computer and look at personal information, whatever. I also took any financial information that I could find, um, the credit cards, uh, the children's birth certificates, uh, my social security card, their social security card, and I kept it in this bag. And whenever I went somewhere, I always had this bag with me, or if I was at the house, it was always within um, arm's reach in case I had to leave very quickly. And 
So when I arrived at the house, the first thing he wanted to know was, where's the key of the safe? And I told him, the key is in a safe location. And once we meet in front of the lawyers, um, we'll divvy up what's in the safe and it'll be above board. Well, he didn't like that because his parents were trying to buy him a condo. Now, it's been seven days since he put a gun in his mouth, tried to kill himself, and they're going to buy him a condo. And they wanted a down payment, and he wanted to use that money as a down payment. So at that point, I wanted to have a conversation with him because we had not had a conversation yet that we're, hey, we are getting a divorce. This is what's going to happen. But, you know, he wouldn't listen to me. He didn't want to have this conversation. So at the time, I still assumed that my sister-in-law was my friend and that she would listen. So I said, look, I need a witness. And so I pulled her aside and instead of her being a witness or just mediating the conversation, she immediately turned the conversation to, this is how you will divvy up your finances. This is how you will sell the house. This is how you will um, have child custody. I mean, it was everything. It was almost like a script and it was all it, for his benefit. And at that point, I didn't realize that she had become a flying monkey because he had been grooming her for years. He had been grooming his family, his father, his aunt. And I really think now that when I went away for two days each month for my Army Reserve commitments, he would take the children to her house or his parents' house or his aunt's house, and he would spend the whole weekend talking about how my wife, she leaves me with the kids while she goes and plays soldier for two days, and I'm doing everything I can to keep the marriage together. We have so many problems, but, you know, she'd rather go off and with her army buddies. Well, my sister-in-law, you know, she said, oh, you know you guys have had problems for months. Everybody knows you've had problems. And, well, I had not told anyone that we had problems. I hadn't told anyone, not even my parents, that we were going to marriage counseling, but apparently he had been telling anyone and everyone who would listen, you know, how he was doing everything he could to keep this marriage together, and I just didn't care. So, a couple hours I endured of them taking my stuff, putting it in boxes, whatever, and finally I'd had enough. Now, in hindsight, I wish I had called the police. I wish I would have called the cops and said, there are people trespassing on my property, they're trying to take my stuff, um, please come. But I think that might have escalated the situation, I don't know. But I told them, I need you, out, you guys out of here. I've had barely eight hours to process that I'm even getting a divorce. So you need to get out. So they did leave, but I found out later that they had went to go look at a condo uh, to, to buy him. And it, it's just strange. I mean, this is not normal behavior. Normal people who put a gun in their mouths and try to kill themselves don't seven days later go and look at property, as his dad put it. You don't go buying real estate after you've just gotten out of the mental hospital. But, you know, nothing about, nothing about my narc or his family is normal. Uh, at this point, I didn't realize that he's, the flying monkeys could also abuse me via social media. I had blocked him and I blocked most of his family, but I didn't realize that we had mutual friends. I, I use that in quotation marks, friends, because they were reporting on me. They were watching and seeing what, whatever I did because I had to go to the emergency room. I had an infection in my eye, um, a corneal infection. It was very serious. And I had to have two antibiotics for it. And he used that. He texted me like, how dare you get an infection that needs two antibiotics in your eye? Are our children going to contact this? You know, what kind of lifestyle have you been leading to get an infection? And I knew at that point that I needed to do a culling of the herd on my Facebook page because there were obviously flying monkeys on that Facebook page, too. So I got rid of a lot of people on Facebook, and I suggest if you are going through a divorce, either shut down your Facebook page or don't say anything on your Facebook page at all. The thing about divorce, especially from a narcissist, you learn very quickly who your true friends are and who the flying monkeys are, and you need to know the difference between, between the two. Well, that's all for now. Be safe. Be vigilant. Take care. Bye.